All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Dean Lees at uh, Buckley Associates, and I'm a member of the engineering and marketing team here at Buckley. Uh, before we start the webinar, I'd just like to say a few words uh, to start. Thank you to everyone participating today for taking some time out of your day to spend with us and learn about uh, energy code trends and decoupled cooling systems. Uh, it means a lot to us that you're taking some time out of your day. A lot of effort goes into the planning of these webinars and, and we're happy that you see a value in the services we're providing to the engineering and contractor community here in the Northeast. Um, a little story about today's webinar quick, just to get started. Uh, this was something that Price gave on a national level uh, a few months back and some Buckley team members were on the line. We saw some value in it and we thought we could take it down to a local level and provide some energy code trends that we're seeing here in the Northeast specific to our market. Uh, when we're talking about designing buildings and designing engineering systems, HVAC systems that go into these buildings, energy uh, more and more becomes a topic of discussion and an engineering challenge. So, uh, you know, we're happy to present this to you. We're happy to have Price on the line. We have some panelists that are gonna be presenting today. They're all experts in this. Uh, we also deal with these systems at each of our branches on a daily basis at Buckley. We have 10 mechanical engineers on staff that support the Northeast market for design and application support on all of Buckley's applied and engineered products. Um, so if you have any questions following the webinar or you have a project you're currently working on, please reach out to myself or your local Buckley representative, uh, whether it's on a topic related to this webinar or if it's on any of, other, uh, of our other products here at Buckley, we're always happy to help and get involved. Uh, if you don't know who your point of contact is at Buckley, uh, please reach out to Sherry uh, Malone in our office or myself, and we can let you know who your contact is at Buckley and uh, put you in the right direction. A um, few things before I hand it over to Krista to introduce the presenter. Uh, there's quite a few people on the webinar, so you're all going to be muted during the webinar to help things run smoothly. Uh, I think. Krista may go over some more of this in detail, but you can use the chat function to uh, ask questions as we go along and we'll handle those at the end. Uh, this webinar is also eligible for PDH credits. So if you need those, please let us know. Um, and with that, I'll, uh, I'll hand it over to Krista. All right, perfect. Thanks, Dean. Uh, so thank you for everybody for joining us today. If you are looking for a webinar on energy code trends and decoupled cooling systems, you are in the right place. Uh, my name is Krista Malone. I'm with Price Industries, and I'll be moderating today's event. Uh, this presentation is copyrighted by Price Industries. And before we begin, just want to go over some administrative items. First of all, audio is being broadcasted through the Internet, but if you experience any audio problems, it's best to call in using a phone line and the phone number that's provided for you on your webinar toolbar. Questions can be submitted any time during today's presentation using that chat or question function uh, on your webinar toolbar. We'll try to answer all of your submitted questions during the Q&A session at the conclusion uh, of the presentation if there are any questions. Additionally, a PDF copy of this presentation is available for download now in the handout section of your webinar toolbar if you'd like to download that now and reference for later. This webinar is brought to you by Price Industries and is accredited for one professional development hour. After the event, all those who have signed in will receive an email with a link to request your PDH credit for attending this webinar. Please visit our website at priceindustries.com for related webinar presentations. So today we have three presenters uh, for our presentation, uh, Ed Fruth, Chris Burroughs, and Nathan Vaughn. Uh, Ed Fruth is our regional sales manager for the Northeast. He has 40 years of HVAC and system design experience with 18 years of experience in applied systems, chillers, air handlers, and temperature controls. Uh, he's also supported engineers designing chillers, ha air handlers, chill beams, and stratified systems for 20 years. 
Nathan Vaughn is our product application engineer. He has over six years of HVAC and system design experience. Uh, over five years of experience in shield beam design and applications, and has worked on over 200 shield beam projects across North America. Uh, Chris Burroughs is our product manager for our stratified air systems uh, product line. He has over six years experience with stratified technologies. He's been involved in over 10 million square foot of stratified air projects, and he also participates nationally on ASHRAE Technical Committee 5.3 Room Air, and Technical Committee 9.7 Education Facilities. So without further ado, I'll hand it over, our presentation over to Mr. Ed Fruit. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Chris had said, my name is Ed Fruit. I'm the Regional Sales Manager uh, for the Northeast. Uh, I also reside uh, in Massachusetts, uh, just south of, uh, of Boston, and I've been part of the community for uh, really my most if not all of my career um, so today's course is uh, is on energy codes and decoupled cooling systems and uh, we're going to take a 10,000 foot view of uh, how these codes have uh, been created here in uh, Massachusetts uh, and spend uh, a little bit of time talking specifically about the stretch code and uh, some potential changes uh, to the stretch code in uh, in the coming months uh, earliest or within the next couple of years. So uh, with that being said, um, oh, let's see if I can get my mouse here to move this forward. Um, all right, so learning objectives uh, by the end of this presentation, I think most of you guys can read through this. Uh, we'll understand some about how some of these codes come together with the local jurisdictions uh, as far as codes go, uh, the impact systems have on energy usage and how to coupled cooling systems impact these systems. Um, the agenda is pretty much uh, outlined here. Uh, we will spend uh, quite a bit of time uh, talking about uh, the CMR uh, 780 and uh, and also also which is not really uh, listed here is uh, talking about AIA the 2030 challenge okay so let's talk a little bit about energy you know as a holistic topic uh, in 2012 this was uh, the breakdown of energy and uh, notice this 40 to 50 percent of the energy consumption was attributed to HVAC and if you look at this quadrant here, you know, talking about space heating, ventilation, space cooling, these are the things that, you know, add up to that 50%. The rest of, you know, the plug loads associated to uh, buildings are here. Um, and, you know, it's, it's quite a, you know, bit of energy if you look at it from a, uh, you know, a, a number standpoint. So in 2012, uh, we used 6,963 trillion BTUs uh, in the U.S. In 2019, that grew to 100.2 quadrillion uh, BTUs. Um, this is a ton of energy, um, and we've done nothing over the course of the last really uh, seven or eight years here uh, but grow this number. Uh, what's interesting is that we haven't really changed much associated to how we uh, quantify that. We're still using, you know, 40 to 50 percent of our energy uh, in buildings. Um, uh, things have been piling up, though, with this. Uh, there's a lot of political pressure associated to uh, energy consumption. There's a, a lot of groups out there uh, promoting green buildings, promoting uh, reduced carbon. Uh, we've got a lot of influences with global warming that we're, you know, we're seeing in our back doors, you know, with uh, weather patterns changing and, uh, you know, things being really hot in some places, things being extremely cold in other places. It's, uh, I think all of us are getting a opinion that there is something going on, but the political pressures have never been any greater. So let's talk about what code do you use and how these codes uh, come together. And uh, this is where I was saying, uh, let's look at this from a holistic standpoint, from a beginning standpoint. 
So if we look at the benchmark for commercial building energy codes, most of us are familiar with 90.1. Uh, 90.1 has been around roughly for 35 years. Uh, it was created 1975-ish during the oil embargo. And basically it creates the minimum requirements for energy efficient design for most buildings. Um, there's actually a 90.2, which is a, a residential piece of this. Um, so the 90.1 is, is the commercial piece. Uh, so they, it runs on cycles. Um, so every three years, uh, ASHRAE revises their code uh, and basically submits it for review. And uh, you know it's adopted by cities and towns. It runs parallel with ASHRAE uh, in a different cycle, and they're about a year off, uh, is the International Energy Conservation Code. So a little history behind the International Energy Conservation Code. Uh, roughly, this is created around 1994 through a group called the International Code Council. Uh, the International Code Council is a group of uh, building officials and code administrators around the United States and different organizations that came together to create an organization uh, to provide code standards. And, and it's just not on energy, it's really building standards, how, how buildings are built, um, what type of performance is associated to the, to the building. This is everything from uh, an architectural standpoint all the way down to you know how we do stick construction and things of that nature um, so the codes are basically uh, every three years like ashray but they're offset by roughly about a year um, let me go back one here um, the third group that is really beginning to uh, add some pressure to the way that we do our codes is AIA. And AIA has a 2030-0 energy challenge that they've been pushing around the country. Uh, they've been pushing it nationally. They've been pushing it locally, whether it's a local ASHRAE, uh, excuse me, a local AIA uh, chapter like here in Boston or the national chapter. Um, so look at energy codes from the standpoint of 90.1 and Appendix G. Uh, Appendix G has changed quite a bit over the course of the last six years or so. The biggest change in 90.1 Appendix G is the baseline. So in 2016, uh, the appendix was changed so that when we're looking at performance for buildings, we are looking at a baseline of 2004. Uh, this is a big deal. Prior to this, uh, when we were looking at the baseline, it, there, there really was no baseline. It was kind of all over the map. There was really no target that we were kind of shooting for. So things were really more from a prescriptive perspective where, you know, we were looking at certain performances for certain products or, uh, but not necessarily systems. And, uh, and that's changed quite a bit. Uh, originally, it was the prescriptive method. Uh, and then it turned into what we call the energy cost budget, the ECB. And uh, currently we're looking at the BPF, the building performance factor. And everybody's kind of getting in, in this game. Even Leeds has a uh, compliance path that they call the building performance factors. Um, and it's a little bit different, but the bottom line is that we look at a particular climate zone, we look at a building type and we're giving a, a factor. Uh, and we use math to basically figure out what uh, what type of performance we need for a building. So looking at this uh, from, you know, over the course of time and history, uh, starting in 1975, 90.1 uh, really kind of got off to a slow start. Uh, it wasn't until really 2000, 2005 when really uh, this took hold and, uh, and we started getting aggressive. Uh, as you can see, uh, from 2004 to uh, 2019, there was roughly a 40% a reduction from the baseline. But we've really kind of stalled a little bit here. There was some really big uh, increases or decreases, if you will, uh, in the 2007-2010 range. Um, but after 2016, you know, it's really kind of slowed a little bit. Um, so looking at IEC, um, 
little history on IEC is that uh, the International Code Council, ICC, works with ASHRAE, the DOE, the National Fire Protection Association, and really anybody uh, that's associated to generating codes for uh, cities and towns. They really monitor what, uh, what these groups do. Uh, specifically, they monitor ASHRAE 90.1, and then the International uh, Energy Code Council, which is really kind of their, their 90.1. Uh, the, DO, the DOE, the federal government, basically reviews these two uh, baseline um, uh, codes, and, uh, and they determine which code uh, is more energy efficient, and then basically they push this down to the state and local government. Uh, from a residential standpoint, uh, once this happens, uh, the states or towns have two years to consider adopting whatever the newest, um, more efficient code is. Uh, if they don't elect it, uh, they have to submit reasoning to the U.S. Secretary of Energy. From a commercial standpoint, they have to uh, accept whatever the latest uh, version of this is. So this uh, on the bottom here is actually a blurb from um, the U.S. Department of Energy uh, website, uh, and it's pretty clear uh, on exactly, you know, what needs to be done here. So what are the changes that have happened in IEC, IECC? In, in a lot of ways, there really wasn't a big change from 2015 to 2018. Uh, no noticeable big changes in efficiency from 2015. The IECC only minor, roughly a 2.2 to a 5% uh, increase in performance. They, uh, most of the stuff that they're, they've changed in the codes associated are more associated to things like lighting, um, you know, water flows. Uh, there are a few HVAC related that are more geared to us, like fan efficiencies. Uh, associated heat recovery ventilators and uh, energy re uh, recovery ventilators, um, but generally speaking, only some minor changes. Um, interestingly enough, though, is uh, in 2019, the National AIA uh, group introduced a zero code renewable energy appendix to IE ICC. And in doing so, they, uh, in June of last year, brought this to the ICC committee. They agreed that uh, this zero code renewable energy appendix had some value, and they proposed it to the IECC uh, conservation group. And it was accepted in November of last year. And what that means is that in 2021, the, which will be the next update for uh, the International Energy Conservation Code, there's going to be a voluntary appendix for a zero code renewable energy, uh, which is a pretty big deal. It's, uh, it, and I'll, I'll show you exactly how this works, but uh, in 2021, not only will there be a zero code renewable energy appendix, but their efficiencies uh, in, for performance in buildings will also go up a minimum of 10% from where we are in uh, in 2018. So we're taking a big stab at this and we're also going to a zero code renewable energy. But in 2021, this will be a voluntary element. But if you go back and look at what happened in 2013 with Appendix G and ASHRAE, they basically had like a venting period for three years. Um, in 2013, they they had basically introduced Appendix G, and in 2016, Appendix G became part of the code. So there is a lot of uh, discussion that this is exactly what's going to take place uh, for the International Energy Code or Conservation Code. So let's talk about AIA a bit then, because these are the guys that are uh, really having some influence um, with this 2030 challenge. And it's a, a pretty simple uh, approach. Basically, you design a building using the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code, uh, and you need to 
meet that code uh, for performance. Uh, you can do that in many different ways. Uh, there's a, uh, a prescriptive uh, version, and then you can do energy, energy simulation. Uh, once you do that, you're given a renewable uh, energy um, value or number that basically says that uh, you need to uh, provide this amount of renewable energy, uh, and then you have to figure out whether it's off-site uh, or on-site. Uh, but there are, are no trade-offs. Um, you need to meet the efficiency of the 2021 code and basically replace any of that energy that you create in the building. So let's take a quick walk on how this looks. This is a, from a perspective, perspective the 50,000 square foot building. It's uh, climate zone 3A, it's an office building. You come up with a, um, a energy util utilization uh, intensity uh, number, which is 29, and that gives you the KBTUs. Uh, you do some math, then basically what it says is that you need to provide 425 megawatts of renewable energy. Uh, pretty simple, your choices, are basically on site is so let's just use a PV example is putting it on the roof or putting it on a parking job parking lot and uh, if you provide the 425 and you uh, meet the performance on the code then you meet the code uh, if you go the uh, performance route where you model your building you go from basically the prescriptive of 29 kbtus to 18 based upon your model and that number could be pretty much anything you uh you do some math and, and in this example you're showing that all you need to do now is provide 264 megawatts of renewable energy the key here is that they're basically saying is the more efficient you make your building the less renewable energy you're going to have to provide and there's some really big incentives now for having uh, renewable, uh, not excuse me, more efficient buildings and more efficient building systems. The last piece I'll look at real quickly here is that the other prescriptive path would be um, to do on-site um, and off-site um, renewable. And if you're doing off-site renewable, then basically you have to take a 25% penalty on your offsite renewable. So if you can't do it on site, uh, it gets really costly. Uh, so once again, the more efficient you can make your, your building, if you can make your building net zero, you don't have to provide any renewable energy. And that's really basically what they're saying. So mass energy code, let's take a little look at mass energy code. Massachusetts has done a really good job over the course of the last, you know, eight or ten years. Uh, specifically, over the course of the last five or six years, uh, they've been in the top uh, five uh, states in the country as far as Leeds concerned for uh, most energy efficient um, buildings in the country. All right, so uh, we've got lots of uh, lead gold and lead silver uh, in Massachusetts. Most of you guys probably know where they are. Um, Massachusetts Energy Code is uh, 780 CMR. Uh, most of you guys are probably familiar with it. We're in the ninth edition of this. Um, as part of the 780 CMR, there is the Green Communities Act, which was adopted in 2008, which basically says that the energy code needs to be updated uh, every three years to be consistent with the most recent version of the International Energy Conservation Code. So that's the starting point. In Massachusetts, a little bit of a trick is there's many different paths you can go, but at minimum, uh, there's this uh, Energy Conservation Code that's updated every three years, required by state law. So chapter 13 of the code basically uh, talks about the different uh, options here, and if you look at what you could choose from uh, if you're designing, you have the ability to follow 90.1 currently, 2016 90.1, using Appendix G, or you can use the International uh, Conservation Code, 
Uh, currently it's 2015, um, but the, um, it will be updated to 2018 shortly. Uh, or you could follow the stretch code. And if you know what the stretch code is, basically the stretch code takes uh, currently uh, the 2013 90.1 code and says you need to be 10% more efficient than that. Um, which is an interesting thing because um, more than 90% of the communities in Massachusetts have adopted the stretch code. Uh, so going back to these other previous charts, um, these options that we, uh, that we have for either following Appendix G or the International Conservation Code, really uh, the stretch code is really what's used in most cases for most cities and towns. Um, so taking a deeper look at that, I have a little problem here with my uh, screen, um, the 10th edition of the 7A CMR are coming out soon. Um, and there's a little twist to this, and that is that AIA in Massachusetts submitted a zero credit renewable energy amendment to Appendix 115, which is the stretch code. Uh, and they want to uh, update that for the 10th edition of um, the Mass State Building Code. Uh, effectively, they want to update the stretch code to have a zero credit renewable energy. Um, simultaneously though, guys, there's a bill in the State House um, that was filed on 118 of 2019 that is requesting a net zero stretch energy code, uh, not a voluntary one. Basically, they're saying we want a, uh, a net zero energy code. And this is kind of the path that's happened over the course uh, of the last uh, year here in 2019. National uh, proposes the zero energy in, nine, in November of last year. It's approved really at the same time, unbeknownst to a lot of people, AIA Massachusetts, the local chapter, um, proposes the same thing to our local officials. Uh, on 118, a, a bill is filed at the State House, and currently we're in between uh, codes here. So effectively, we're, we're 2015 to date is where we are. We're in a concurrency period um, between, uh, I think it was February of this year to August 7th of this year, where we're kind of in that uh, concurrency period. There is conversation that they may potentially push out uh, the change from 2015 to 2018 for another six months, which would be the first of the year. And if that happens, that means it would only really be in effect, the 2018 would only be in effect for a year. So there's a strong possibility that we may uh, jump directly to the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code. Here in Massachusetts. Um, but a lot running parallel with that and understand that the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code is an appendix that is optional. If it's approved at the state level, it won't be optional. The stretch code will be a net zero energy code uh, re with renewable energy. Um, so one way or the other, it's either going to come in at the IECC level um, next, the, the next version will be optional, but I would pretty much guarantee the, the version after that, three years after that, it won't be optional. That will be part of the code. Um, or, uh, you know, as soon as the, you know, that, who knows when this bill is going to be in front to be voted on, uh, it could be a net zero energy code, Massachusetts, based on the stretch code in, uh, in months or, or, you know, or within the next year, I would say. So, you know, what does that all mean to us? Uh, it means that energy codes are changing really fast in Massachusetts. Uh, we probably will ex will be expecting a renewable net zero energy code in 2021. Uh, if not in 2021, sometime really soon. 
And, uh, and if you're working on a project today using the stretch code, keep your head to the ground because there may be some changes sooner than we all think. Uh, with that being said, we have some solutions uh, for this. Um, they're uh, solutions that uh, Price does offer. And, uh, and that's really what we wanna talk about next here is if we go to the net zero energy code, uh, what are those systems that will help you guys uh, design to reduce uh, the performance in the building to the point where you may not have to provide renewable energy? With that being said, I'd like to turn this over to Chris, Chris Burrows, um, and Chris will run through the HVAC system components piece of this. Chris, take it away. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Ed. Um, and thanks to everyone who's joining us today. So we wanna just in this next section, go, go through rather briefly and touch on um, a couple of the components that we're, we're gonna be talking about and kind of classify them in a way that, you know, really focus on the parts um, that we feel there's a lot of flexibility on uh, and, and provides us opportunities, uh, you know, and tools in the toolkit, if you will, to, to be able to achieve these types of energy uh, levels that that ed has been talking about um, earlier in this presentation so um, you know the first part we want to talk about the generation components uh, that make up an hvac system so these are the the uh, the the equipment that's essentially creating the energy you know creating the the cooling and heating uh, required for the space um, and this could be you know air cooled uh, water cooled chillers as well as you know your packaged uh, rooftop units, as well as your dedicated outside air units. Um, obviously, these these are used in in quite different systems as it relates to the uh, the downstream components. But um, you know, for the most part, they're packaged. They've got some flexibility in terms of the internal components and, and features. But uh, you know, for the most part, um, there's a set amount of options or flexibilities flexibility within uh, these components. Um, if you go into, again, the distribution components. Uh, these are your, your water pumps, um, as well as your you know, various air moving equipment, uh, vertical fan coils, as well as horizontal fan coils, um, terminal VAV units, as well as a chilled beam uh, component as well. And, and again, this takes that um, energy um, you know, from the generation components and essentially moves it throughout the space um, accordingly based on, you know, space conditions and maintaining certain space conditions. So this, um, there's a lot of, of opportunity we feel to modify and change up the approaches with um, essentially how we distribute that energy into the space. Um, whether it's a, an air approach or you use water um, or refrigerant um, to move that energy into the space and control it accordingly, you know, that has a lot of impact on, um, you know, the decision making on the the distribu distribution components and what happens upstream and the, the types of systems that could work and pair quite nicely together. So we'll talk uh, about that um, in a bit more. So, you know, when you look on average, um, you know, this is, is looking on some past projects, um, you know, at the peak power or horsepower required to, uh, to move, um, essentially, you know, provide cooling or heating to the space, about 45% little under half uh, is contributed by a, the distribution systems. Um, so all those components we were talking about on the slide before. And again, this is a traditional um, VAV all air, uh, you know, ceiling system uh, that we're talking about here. And in roughly 55% is uh, contributed by the components and the, the chillers and the, the rooftop units. Um, so we're going to kind of for just the sake of, of this conversation, focus on the distribution systems and uh, how we can, you know, make uh, several decisions that would impact um, benefitly uh, benefit the uh, the energy uh, consumption and reduce that overall for the for the projects um, that we're talking about. So there's kind of three types that we we look at today: um, an all-air system, which is the first one here, as well as uh, shifting a lot of the energy transfer over to a water type media. Um, commonly referred to as a hydronic system, like a, a chill beam or a fan coil type of approach, um, as well as a refrigerant uh, system, a VRF type of uh, system, variable refrigerant. So the first one 
you know, in looking at a, a traditional uh, concept where you're using um, air uh, to condition essentially your ventilation and latent loads, as well as the space sensible loads, uh, means that when you're using a full, you know, a full air system, your shaft sizes are going to be sized to account for that total peak airflow requirement. Uh, the fans are sized to condition uh, or to move that total air volume needed to condition sensible in ventilation and your, your minimum airflow as well. And essentially what's what's happening here is that you're, you've got your secondary um, ductwork distribution that's running out to supply air to, in this case, uh, you know, a VAV terminal device uh, that dampers and modulates the air accordingly for that individual space. And that's supplying out through a, a ceiling diffuser shown here. Um, when you have a, a chill beam system, and again, Nathan will will talk on this in further detail uh, in a little bit, but uh, essentially it's it's more of a decoupled sensible cooling approach where instead of a a packaged uh, rooftop unit where you're sizing for your your full airflow or total airflow to condition your ventilation and your sensible, instead this is just a dedicated outside air unit that is uh, you know much smaller typically than a your rooftop unit because you're you're really just conditioning um, the outside air uh, as it's named accordingly so um, that's really size for your latent uh, and your ventilation um, needed for this space and then your your a lot of your cooling is being generated by a, uh, a chiller um, and a boiler um, to provide cooling and heating to the space so that's uh, providing piping uh, water piping down to, into the individual zones to the chill beams that is using, um, you know, pressurizing the plenum and in, in, in within the chill beam and providing induction, you know, mixing some of that uh, room air to provide uh, cooling up through that coil that's uh, located in each unit. So nice thing is you've, you've got a reduction in, in fan size overall for the project. Um, you're also handling um, the cooling very effectively uh, within each zone. Uh, using the, the chilled beam approach, modulating that water valve. And then the, the last one is the, the variable refrigerant type of approach. And again, this is similar to the previous slide where you've got that decoupled approach. Uh, the fresh air, outside air, is being handled by the DOAS equipment, so on the rooftop. Um, but now you have several condenser units that are you know, either designed for a zone or a couple zones, um, but um, essentially that is uh, providing the, the cooling generation to move the energy through a refrigerant type of um, transport media. And again, you get the, the same benefits of reducing your fan size and equipment uh, on the air moving side um, because you're just conditioning the, that partial load, um, the latent and ventilation in the space. And then that refrigerant pipe, you know, runs out to the, the spaces um, or to a, a terminal device or fan coil that essentially um, provides your total cooling for the space through, uh, you know, a typical diffuser in the case we're showing here. So that's a, a very high level, but hopefully just a, a quick primer, I'm sure a refresher for, for everyone um, uh, as, it, as it relates to, you know, these systems we, we do deal with uh, quite often. Uh, the next one here is we want to dial it, it down into a stratified air system. and um, and basically talk about what that system is. If you haven't seen it before or haven't uh, designed with it before, this is essentially a system, whether it's the sidewall, low level type of approach, which is what's shown here with the displacement diffuser or a supplying from the floor and a raised floor. The idea is that you're supplying the cool fresh air directly into the breathing zone and you're moving the air typically through just natural convection. So you can see here the, the typical load given off of an occupant um, to, to represent here in this thermal mannequin. And you can see the air is being pulled directly to the heat sources. Um, so contaminants, you know, from breathing and various things that are associated with heat sources um, get uh, carried up generally upwards um, above the breathing zone when you have these types of systems. So uh, you're letting it kind of trickle out at low velocity around, uh, you know, 30, 40 feet per minute in a lot of cases and essentially using the heat sources to move the air in the space instead of pushing it at high static, you know, from high up above down low. So 
there's a, a stratification uh, within these spaces. So, you know, ASHRAE allows, you know, seven degrees or so for a standing occupant from ankle to head height. Um, and then you have even a higher temperature up in that return zone um, that uh, essentially creates that stratification in the space due to how this is operating. So very, very quiet system and um, effective using that natural convection. So again, one approach is an underfloor air system where you've got the, uh, the secondary shaft is still a DOAS unit supplying air through the, the space, um, as well as the uh, secondary approach running it out to vertical air towers. And so these units are placed in a small mechanical closet and they are conditioning the air, discharging it downwards underneath the floor. And so in the interior space, usually you have a, a round floor diffuser, uh, could be VAV or even occupant controlled. Um, and then at the perimeter, you've either got fan boxes ducted to perimeter grills, or in this case, what we're seeing more often is a linear trough unit that provides the coil um, directly in the plenum itself, and it operates on natural convection. So, you know, supplying from the floor, you can discharge at higher temperatures uh, than you would from the ceiling, but also operating a natural convection, heating the room air um, effectively is, is quite energy efficient. So that can help save on loads as well. So, you know, benefits is higher ventilation effectiveness. Um, you are a pretty quiet system. You usually only need about 0.05 inches of static pressure to drive the air through this space. You can also see there's minimal ductwork. Um, so the idea is that it's really a simple, quick system to install, um, but you also don't need uh, that much sheet metal in, if you're using the, the air tower approach where your delivery is very close to those uh, you know, perimeter areas. So uh, typical supply temperatures are, you know, 62 to 65, and uh, they work quite well with, you know, uh, low heating uh, water temperatures, 100 to 140. So it works quite well with, you know, high efficiency uh, heat recovery chillers or condensing boilers um, is, is pretty typical for this approach. So um, increased air economizer hours, as you probably already guessed, so moving from 55 up to 65 degrees, as long as you know, dew point and enthalpy is, is considered. Um, there could be a lot of hours throughout the year, whether you're designing even locally or out of state, where that could be a significant energy savings as well. So on that note, I um, want to talk about the, uh, the um, foundation uh, building that's located on 505th Avenue in Seattle. And here you can see a linear bar grill supplying the air directly into the breathing zone and then can't see it here in this picture, but there's a return grill up uh, above in the, the cloud feature up here. So you always want to return up high and pull the warmest air out of the space. And as close to, you know, the perimeter as possible um, if, if you're uh, far enough away from the perimeter. So this project uh, was finished up just a couple years ago and, and they um, achieved lead platinum. In the article released by High Performance Buildings by ASHRAE, they noted the significant energy contributors here were UFAD uh, system, um, as well as the central plant with, with high, high efficiency chillers and boilers and heat recovery chillers, as well as solar domestic hot water heating and then daylighting. So, you know, using a underfloor air plenum, that's the interstitial space is about 12 inches in height in most cases, no higher than that, um, instead of a, you know, two to three foot interstitial space or void up in a, a drop ceiling uh, air delivery approach. Um, that can allow you a little bit more daylighting even. So that could save on, you know, um, uh, lighting loads as well as uh, improving, um, you know, the indoor environmental quality. So they had seen 40% energy savings over the 90.1 2004 baseline that Ed was talking about earlier. Um, they were an office and database or are in office and database. Uh, data center. So they, uh, the office only portion <clears throat> measured about uh, 42 kb2s per square foot a year um, for the EUI. Uh, and this was with several features, you know, in achieving pl lead platinum. So the UFAT allowed them to increase 30% of outside air over ASHRAE levels. Um, and again, not doing that with a huge energy penalty because you can pre cool for, uh, for some of those hours throughout the year. Uh, the other project is a you know, energy um, 
savings effort with Upper Iowa University. In this liberal arts building, they provided ventilation through the round floor diffusers underneath the raised floor. And then they had a radiant chilled sail product up in the ceiling that uh, provided radiant cooling and or heating into the space very comfortably. <clears throat> so that was combined with a ground source heat pump, um, quite a, quite a uh, progressed system uh, um, or premium system, but it's still, they were able to recoup it, their initial cost in about three and a half years. <clears throat> um, and they, they noted about 67% energy savings um, measured by the local energy. Uh, code company, and they compared that to the baseline, basically a building um, that was uh, across the street of same kind of footprint size and, and application. So the last one here is, um, as you saw in the smoke video, the, the displacement ventilation approach where you've got either your <clears throat> low-level uh, wall diffusers here. Um, this one here is still a decoupled approach. You could, of course, use just a DAV type of system. Um, with an all-air approach, but this one is using fan coils to mix the space for turn air in through a filter and supply your, you know, 62 to 68 degrees into the displacement diffusers. There's also opportunity to do it through the ceiling. Um, this one here is an equal switchover unit that can provide heating through a, uh, a slot diffuser and throw across the ceiling or down um, vertically. So that could be a good option for, for retrofit. Um, if, if that need arises. So a lot of the same benefits kind of go through this uh, quickly and uh, and show you that um, a lot of the same benefits with the UFAD system, similar temperatures, again, works well with, you know, entering water conditions that uh, <laughs> that we were talking about on the previous slides. So lastly, just close out with a displacement project that this was a net zero energy ready building. Um, that uh, was done in Utah, and the, the big contributors were displacement ventilation, um, which is integrated here into this drywall chase running down into the plenum. And then there was two diffusers per classroom, one in each corner opposite each other. And it was combined with a you know ground source um, geothermal loop that ran underneath the field. And for this particular climate, they were actually able to re remove any mechanical cooling throughout the year or occupied hours throughout the year. Um, so they've they've really uh, seen a lot of benefit with this. In fact, they're using this approach on a, most of their schools in that area, um, especially in that school district, um, because of these, these benefits um, that they're seeing long term. <clears throat> so in terms of uh, energy savings, so without adding any renewables uh, and PV, they were at about 17 kb2s per square foot, which is quite a significant savings over a you know, a, a typical efficient school in that area that uh, achieves a, a, an energy star label. So their operating costs were about, uh, you know, a, a quarter per square foot uh, as compared to a dollar per square foot for most of the traditional, you know, uh, schools using traditional approaches. <clears throat> and uh, so that's that's been quite staggering uh, results to see. So um, with that, I will pass it now over to Nathan Vaughn, who will go through a couple of the sec sections here. Thanks, Chris. So uh, before we jump into our next system, we'll talk about, uh, I'd like to kind of dive into the, air, the transport mediums that we, we saw earlier. So Chris mentioned we had the, the air systems, the hydronic water-based systems, and also refrigerant-based systems. Um, so let's take a, a quick look at those before we move on to our next system. Um, so kind of jumping right in before we get into these examples, um, we'll look at a, a sample building of a 200 by 200 square foot or foot space um, and assuming a 25 BTU load. Uh, so if you do the math there, you'll, get, you'll come up with about a, a million BTUs. Um, so that's going to be our baseline here that we're, we're doing this math around. Um, so the first system we'll, we'll look into here is the, the all-air system. So all of that million BTUs is handled by a package air handler or just uh, the rooftop unit. It's all coming from that one device and being pushed around through the airflow. Um, so in that case, we're going to come up with about 18.6 horsepower of um, transport energy, essentially, uh, the distribution energy, as Chris mentioned earlier. And some of our um, assumptions here in the bottom right, I won't uh, speak to those uh, due to time, but um, both are there if you want to take a peek at it later. Um, so we're comparing this, this distribution energy to our generation energy, um, so the compressor uh, that's really creating that BTUs before you distribute around the building. 
Um, so looking at the compressor energy to get to a million BTUs, uh, based on these assumptions on the bottom right, we're going to see about 103 horsepower needed. Um, so to kind of compare those to each other, um, essentially the distribution energy in this system with, with using air as your primary medium is going to be 18% of your total generation energy. Um, so basically the distribution divided by the generation energy is 18%. So the next system, or next uh, medium we, we talked about was water. Um, so same exact load, so a million BTUs, we still wanna hit that uh, BTU target. Um, we're seeing the same uh, compressor generation energy, 103 horsepower, um, and so it's still being generated the same way. Uh, but now the only difference in this case is that we are using water to transport the energy as opposed to the airflow of the previous slide there. So in this case, we're dropping down from 18 uh, horsepower fan energy, now we're using 5.36 horsepower of pump energy just for the water. Uh, if you have only water transporting that uh, energy around the building. And uh, that yields about 5.2% um, of the ratio between distribution energy and transportation energy, or generation energy, sorry. Um, so a much reduced uh, percentage there. Uh, and then thirdly, the last system that we, we see in the market pretty often is VRF, uh, the compressor-based, refrigerant-based systems. Um, so in this case, it's a little bit different. You don't have a separate pump driving the, the water or a separate fan driving the airflow. In this case, the generation is done by the compressor and so is the distribution as well. Um, so what you'll find with this type of data is that uh, the, the capacities that are listed in a catalog essentially are usually done with very short pipe runs. Um, and what's, what you're really gonna see in a building is anywhere from 100 feet uh, of pipe up all the way up to 500 feet. Uh, but in this, for this example, we're gonna take an average of about 200 foot um, so that means, uh, per this chart right here, this is the AHRI uh, testing table. Uh, at 100 foot, uh, between 100 and 120 foot of, of line length of the pipe run, uh, you're going to see about a 6% D-rate in that case. Um, so if you go to a 200 foot average, you'll see about 12% decrease, decrease in capacity there. Um, so what we're seeing is that uh, you'll see about 18%. Uh, we saw that in the first slide with the air system. Uh, the water base is much lower at the 5%. And if you have a 200 foot pipe run, uh, on the refrigerant-based system, you'll see about a 12% D-rate, um, or a percentage of, of uh, distribution energy versus uh, generation energy. Um, so you can see here that the water base is, is pretty much the, the most efficient system um, that you're, you're going to see. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a second, why that is, and, um, and really where the low-hanging fruit on these systems is and why they're able to be more efficient uh, than a more traditional all-air system. Um, so really what we're looking at here is just tackling the the transportation energy, the distribution energy in the building. Um, so really just how, how efficiently can you move the energy, the heat from one space to another to cool that space. Uh, and really what we found is, is by using pumps, pump energy instead of fan energy, that you're really able to reduce that, uh, that by quite a bit. Uh, in this case, we're referring to radiant systems, um, radiant panels and, and beams as well. Um, it would be in particular, you can reduce your airflow by quite a bit, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but between these three examples here, you do see the same exact uh, generation um, energies. You're treating the same loads. The only difference between the three is really how you're delivering that, uh, that capacity around the building. Um, so we'll get into chill beams a little bit. Uh, Chris kind of set this up already. So we've already seen this picture here. Uh, and essentially, we've got a chiller on the rooftop and as well as a DOAS unit. Um, could be a regular air handler, but in this case, we're showing a DOAS. Um, but what was noticed here is that with the chill beam, um, the way it works is you're using pressure differentials to induce a lot of airflow across a water coil. Uh, anywhere from two times to eight times the, the main air that you deliver to that beam can be induced across the water, water coil. Um, so you're, you're really moving a lot of airflow across that water coil with no fan energy uh, in the thermal unit itself. There's no electrical components, nothing moving except for the air in the water. Um, it's a very simple setup uh, and you're able to reduce your, um, your airflow supply to the space by quite a bit. Uh, which we'll talk about in a second here. Um, but a couple other benefits by, by using this type of system and reducing that airflow, uh, you're able to reduce that ductwork by quite a bit. So you can see here we have one riser, one duct riser as opposed to two on the OLR system. And your, your duct collars around the building can be much smaller. Um, usually six to eight inches is, is plenty in most spaces, maybe larger for, depending on the size of the floor, um, could be larger. Uh, but also another side effect of that is you have a very quiet system, which I'll hit in, in a couple more slides as well. A couple of rules of thumb here, uh, for an office space, you're gonna see about a quarter CFM per square foot. Uh, so to compare it to a more standard rule of thumb of one CFM to even one and a half CFM on a VAB system, all our system, um, you're, you're about a quarter of what you would see in those, those buildings for a, an office application. So that's really where 
uh, the energy savings is coming from. It's just, just tackling that fan energy, reducing how much air you need to supply th throughout the building throughout the year as well, and uh, and really just starting there. And that's that's where all the energy savings is coming from. Um, you're going to supply your airflow at uh, your temp air temperatures at uh, 55 degrees dry bulb typical uh, and 51 degrees wet bulb. So a little bit more dry than you would typically see just to avoid condensation. You want to make sure that you uh, you lower that dew point a little bit to, to handle your latent loads. Uh, and we can talk about that. We have a lot of literature on the, the our website for those if you want to dig into that a little bit more. Uh, and then next, the chilled water, 56 to 50, really 58 degrees is pretty common. A couple degrees above dew point is where you want to be. And then uh, Chris may have mentioned earlier, we, we see the hot water temperatures very similar to the displacement system. Um, so about 100 degrees to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so these, these work very well with heat recovery chillers and consistent boilers. So this system kind of pairs well with other energy efficient devices as well, um, kind of that are peripheral to the thermal device. Um, so just to kind of hammer that home, uh, we typically see a 30 to 40% um, potential savings in most applications. So it's very easy to get to a 30% savings. Uh, and really up to a 40, I've seen 50 or 60 actually in uh, some, some spaces that have a very high sensible load. Um, so you can get a lot of savings by just attacking that uh, the, air, the air transport energy through the fan. Um, next uh, option we have here, and give some spaces that may make sense to mix and match devices. Um, so we do have a, uh, a sensible only a uh, fan coil device here. So that's the it's sensible only, so that means we're not condensing on the water coil. Um, so it will take the same temperatures, the water temperatures as the chilled beams do. And uh, this may make sense in a space, like a per perimeter space with lots of glass where you have a lot of fluctuating heat loads throughout the day. <clears throat> or if you uh, you just need so much, um, there's a very dense load, so you don't want to add more air airflow back into that space. So these devices can recirculate the airflow as opposed to adding fresh air from the air handler. Um, so you don't have to add more air through the air handler. You can just recirculate and still handle those very high heat loads in that space. So you can mix and match these systems, and they pair very well because the water temperature is the same to, to keep them from condensing. So a couple examples of that, and uh, we'll wrap up here uh, and uh, hand it back to Dean for some questions. Um, but a couple examples of, of where we've seen chill beams successfully um, done. Uh, this one's in Texas. This is a five-story building. In this building, they actually had a large lobby in the bottom area that did not use chill beams, but everywhere else in the building that was kind of away from an entry zone uh, with very limited risk of uh, infiltration coming into those zones, uh, everywhere else used um, chill beams. So they were able to successfully use that, no condensation issues in this place, and it's a fairly warm, warm, warm and humid climate in Austin. Uh, they actually were targeting lead silver, but were able to heat, hit lead gold. Um, and they've modeled this one at 30% better than the 90.1 2004 baseline. And uh, what's interesting here is they actually found that 23% of the total building savings, energy savings, was uh, accomplished by the fan reduction. Um, so that was pretty cool. And uh, you can't see it in this picture, but uh, there are speakers throughout the building. It was, it was very quiet. They were able to hit 25 NC in almost every space. And uh, it was actually too quiet, so they had to add a noise system back into the space. Um, next one here is a 22-story Class A office tower, a little bit closer to you guys in the Northeast up in Philadelphia now. Um, and we actually do see a lot of these projects come up in the Boston area, so you may be very familiar with this technology already, because um, the Northeast is probably one of the most popular areas for this, this technology. Um, but this is one in Philadelphia, fairly close, uh, 475,000 square feet. Um, and this, they had the same issue um, where they had a very quiet system, it was uncomfortably quiet, so they had to add noise back in across the floors. So if you look very closely, you'll see some circles in the back. It's, it's kind of hard to see, but they're, they're little dropout speakers um, throughout the floor. And uh, one thing I like to point out on this is they actually split the system up. So on the inside you see linear chill beams. Um, so these are going to be two pipe only, only handling cooling. Uh, on the perimeter here, these are actually slotless users that feed from chill beams. So there's a chill beam tucked away, recessed up above here. And those are going to be four pipes. So they're handling the heating load at the perimeter here and uh, saving some piping by not having a four pipe system throughout the building, only on the perimeter uh, do they actually have heat. And last, last example here is a patient room. So this is a case where they had a 5,000 square foot addition beginning, and they came back into the 30, 36,000 more square feet because they're happy with the system. Um, and in this case, they saw a 60% reduction in the in airflow in the patient rooms um, with a dedicated outside air system. But one of the benefits here in a hospital type of environment um, is that you, you're not recirculating the airflow back to the air handler. You're able to recirculate within a space, one zone, and then you supply the air to one through air system, so the dedicated outside air system you're supplying that fresh air and you're exhausting it. It doesn't go back to the air handler in return. Um, so if you have a breakout, you have a contaminant um, kind of relevant today um, by having a disease spread, uh, you're actually exhausting it out. You're not mixing it back through the filters, through the filters de degraded over time. 
and redistributing that contamination back throughout the building. In this case, it would just be exhausted. So there's really a limited risk of that spreading throughout the hospital. Um, and last point here is there's a couple of different types of beams. On the left side, you see a normal chilled beam and a lay-in ceiling. Right side, you've got a hard lid ceiling. This is actually a security chilled beam. Um, so you can see a couple screws there. It's a tamper-proof uh, chilled beam, a little bit more robust, so you can't really get in there. Uh, it's to prevent self-harm and a little more um, just beefed up compared to a normal chilled beam. Um, so that's a couple options that you have in, in different areas of the hospital. And uh, the, the way you're able to save, save the airflow in this case is by including your induced airflow as part of the total airflow uh, requirement. Um, so you see that at minimum two fresh air changes, you can induce at least two more with almost every chilled beam. Um, so you're already covering the air change requirement. You don't have to do it with four air changes of fresh air. Um, so you can reduce the total volume that the air handler is pushing into the, to the patient room. So uh, we've got a quick quote here, but uh, they're just saying that um, essentially the, the building, the wing that they retrofitted was operating much more efficiently than the previous uh, unretrofitted area. Um, so they, they're very happy with the system, no hot and cold complaints, no noise complaints, um, very quiet and very simple to maintain the system actually because it's nothing is, uh, is actually moving. Um, so maintenance is actually a really good benefit to the system as well. And then uh, just to kind of close out here, just going back to the whole price, um, um, what we can offer here, well, we're happy to help out with a system design narrative review. So if you're in the very early stages of a project, you don't know which route to take, uh, we're happy to, to jump in there and weigh the pros and cons of each system. We offer a lot of different types of systems. Um, so we'll jump there in right at the beginning and help you develop your narrative and, uh, and kind of see which one is the best for your particular application. Um, we can do thermal comfort and IAQ analysis. Um, we also have a CFD team as well, so we can help out with that if you have a weird scenario where you want to see what happens uh, to that airflow. We'll help you all the way through to layout assistance and then ordering um, for the whole project. And um, we have uh, dedicated engineers to, to help you out. So feel free to reach out to us if you have questions or if you want to uh, kind of poke our brains. We've got some experience with the system, and uh, we're happy to provide that to you guys as, as you go through this process. Um, so lastly, there's two contacts. Uh, down here, Chris Burroughs and myself, uh, Nathan Vaughn. So feel free to reach out to us with questions, and we can get you the right person if, we're, if it's not us. Um, there's a lot of a lot of knowledge here at Price, so we're happy to share that. And uh, with that, I'll pass you back on to Dean to uh, to answer some questions here. Great, thanks, Nathan, and uh, thanks to Chris and Ed as well, um, and the entire team at Price for helping Buckley to put this on, uh, and for presenting on these topics. Um, you know, uh, in closing, I'd just like to thank everyone on the line that joined us today. I hope everyone enjoyed the webinar and got some useful information out of it. If you have any questions relative to what was discussed today or on any other products that Buckley represents, please reach out to your local representative from Buckley. Uh, if you don't know who that is, again, contact myself or Sherry Malone in our office and we can help point you in the right direction. Uh, and with that, I don't know if there were any questions. Krista, do you want to uh, take it over and uh, answer questions if there were any? Yeah, there was actually only one, uh, Dean. Is, uh, it was asked, is not the stretch code obsolete now that the 2015 ICC has been accepted and in use as part of CMR 780? So I think that would probably be directed at Ed. Yeah, I'm going to get myself off the speaker. Uh, can you repeat that one more time, Krista? Sure thing. The question is, is not the stretch code obsolete now that the 2015 ICC has been accepted and in use as part of CMR 780? No. Uh, so the stretch code, um, well, a couple things. Stretch code is adopted by roughly 80% of the um, people in Massachusetts or the states and towns in Massachusetts. The IECC, the International Energy Conservation Code, currently is in the 2015 version right now. Uh, in August, uh, August 7th of this year, it's supposed to be uh, updated to the 2018. Now in uh, reality, Massachusetts has uh, three years to update to the latest energy code, um, which would be the 2021 uh, International Energy Conservation Code. Um, and the trick here is we could push uh, 
um, the acceptance, because we're in the concurrency period, of the 2015 to 2018 out to January 1st of this year. If that happens, it's very possible that we would um, push or adopt the 2021 energy code right away. Now, all of this is somewhat up in the air right now because we're waiting to hear uh, what's happening with the 2015 concurrency period. If that gets extended to January 1st, then we have another step that we could go through. They could adopt the 2018 in January 1st and only have it uh, basically available for one year. Um, but from what we're hearing, that may not necessarily be the case. It's more than likely that we would jump to the 2021 energy code, the 1st of 2021 or January 1st. So everything's a little bit up in the air. Um, in the next few months, hopefully all this will shake out. So um, hope that answers the question. All right, Dean. All right, great. Thanks, Ed. Uh, I think that's all we had for questions. So again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, and please reach out to myself or, or your Buckley contact if you have any further questions. Thanks everyone and have a good afternoon. Yep, take care now, bye-bye.